everybody. Sorry about the cheesy special effect. Couldn't resist. Well, in this episode, we are going to talk about germ layers, but I'm not going to do this in the way you probably expect. Um, we're not going to talk about the detailed orchestration of gastrulation. We've kind of already gone through that a number of times. Uh, what we're going to talk about instead is how the major germ layers, the three different germ layers, get formed from a signaling point of view. All right, so first we're going to revisit amphibian fate maps, talk about that for just a moment. Then we're going to talk about induction of the germ layers, um, and we're going to use some explant, some classic explant experiments that were done by uh, Nakamura and Newcoop and some other folks to demonstrate this. And then we're going to talk about the molecular signaling that's involved. So I'll be introducing some, uh, some new signaling molecules to you. And <clears throat> then we're going to talk about the difference between induction and what's called the community effect. And then finally, we'll talk about competence. All right, so this is going to not talk about the individual cell movements uh, as much as it's going to be talking about what, how signaling is driving. Not, not which signals so much, there's a little bit of that, but it's going to be more about how signaling is driving this process. Okay, let's dive in. Okay, so we've looked at fate maps before, um, so this should be by way of review. But what you're looking at here are some Xenopus fate maps, and what I'd like to point out to you is that these are all blastulas. All right, so the different colored regions and the labels are telling us what these regions of that blastula, what the cells in those regions are going to become. What's going to happen to make them become those structures is we're going to undergo gastrulation. All right, so the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to specify the various different germ layers and different types of tissue are derived from the different germ layers or different subcategories of the germ layers. So if you look at that frog blastula stage fate map, you see <clears throat> epidermis and neural plate, which are both ectoderm and those are animal pole region. You've got at the vegetal pole endoderm and then sandwiched in between them is prospective mesoderm. Now these are all prospective tissue at this point. None of them are actually uh, endoderm, ectoderm, or mesoderm at this point. Okay. The other two uh, renditions here on the right side of the screen, uh, the one on top shows essentially the same things, a little more detail. Uh, the one on the bottom is showing uh, the three germ layers with the two different ectodermal <clears throat> derivatives, neuroectoderm and non-neuroectoderm, as well as some of the signaling molecules that are involved in those regions. Uh, the other nice thing about that is it shows the polar bodies. At any rate, I just want to point that out to you. Now, what we're going to do today is try to explain not how the entire thing works and how it happens, but to go through some very important processes that are driving this, some of the molecular processes and the signaling processes that are uh, happening during gastrulation. Now, I'm not going to take you through the ballet of cell movement and things like that. We've already gone through that. What we're going to look at here are some experiments that tell us or suggest to us what's turning what into what, who becomes what, and how does it happen. All right, so if we now, uh, <clears throat> let's think about this experimentally and ask the following question. We've got that blastula with the animal cap, the vegetal region, and then the uh, prospective marginal region, which is going to become mesoderm. All right, so the animal cap cells become ectoderm, the vegetal cells become endoderm, and the margin between the uh, <clears throat> topmost part of the animal cap and the topmost part of the vegetal region is what's going to become uh, the mesoderm. Now, what happens if we dissect out these different regions and combine them in different ways to see what happens? Uh, why would we want to do that? Well, perhaps there are signaling molecules being generated by one region 
that are affecting the differentiation of another region. So if we look at a system like that, <clears throat> this is a simple explant experiment, um, and we take that animal cap that was blue in that blastula, and we dissect it out, and then we just lay it down on top of some <clears throat> um, endodermal cells, some prospective endoderm from the vegetal region, all right, what happens is that animal cap exposed to the vegetal fragment will differentiate into mesoderm. So <clears throat> this leads you to suspect, I think correctly, uh, and this is the way it's universally interpreted, that there are some factors in the vegetal cells that are released and that affect the animal cap cells in such a way as to induce them to form <clears throat> mesoderm. Now, <clears throat> that's an interesting experiment, but it doesn't quite answer the question, how do we get mesoderm? So let's, let's think about that for a minute. We know that there are maternal factors that specify the ectoderm and the endoderm. They've already been identified and they're listed on the screen and we'll talk about them very briefly. The mesoderm is specified by zygotic factors, all right? And what we know is that different signals come from different regions of the blastula. So in that vegetal region, uh, that prospective endoderm <clears throat> gets specified by a signal called VEGT, all right? VEGT activates another signal called nodal, and that has an impact on uh, determining that those vegetal cells are going to become endoderm. FOXL1E is probably involved with specifying ectoderm. There's a, another signal called ectodermin that is probably involved in inhibiting the formation of mesoderm. But what is specifying mesoderm itself? So <clears throat> here's another graphical way of looking at it. We, we've got signals coming out of that vegetal region. And eventually we're going to have three different germ layers. How does that happen? What's going on? <clears throat> Here are some of those signals that I was just talking about showing activation and repression. So the arrowheads mean that we're turning something on or stimulating something. And the bars indicate that we are inhibiting something or turning it off. Um, <clears throat> so we know that in the animal pole, that fox... Uh, Fox L1E is actually activating ectodermin, all right, specifying ectoderm. Uh, we also know, pardon me, not, not specifying ectodermin, but specifying ectoderm. We know that Fox uh, L1E also has an inhibiting effect on the formation of mesoderm. And we know that ectodermin has that inhibiting effect on uh, <clears throat> mesoderm. So, there's there's a neighborhood or neighborhoods here where different signals are having different effects. All right, if we go down and look at the vegetal region, I told you that VEGT specifies endoderm. It also turns on nodal. Nodal is a signal that we know is involved with specifying mesoderm itself. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce a couple of other uh, signaling systems here. This is all taken out of your textbook, but you should kind of have a sense of what combinations of signaling molecules are going to drive what uh, outcome in terms of the germ layers. So our cast of characters on this slide, BMP, bone morphogenic protein. Don't pay any attention to the bone part. Uh, it's called BMP because it was discovered while people were looking at osteogenesis at bone formation. It's actually a very, very, uh, <clears throat> it's used for many, many, many different things. It's part of a very large superfamily of proteins called the TGF beta superfamily, transforming growth factor beta. Uh, another player on here is fibroblast growth factor, which we've talked about before. <clears throat> Again, it's called FGF because it was first discovered when studying fibroblasts, not because it is restricted to fibroblasts. 
Um, and then XNR is Xenopus nodal related. So nodal is one of those gene products that was found in flies and then found in just about every animal that's been examined. So if you talk about nodal, you're really talking about a Drosophila gene. If you're talking about nodal in Xenopus, it's XNR, all right? So it's Xenopus nodal related. So if we now transition over to the right side of the slide, what <clears throat> this is telling us here is that the prospective, in the prospective ectoderm, so in the animal cap cells, in the presence of FGF and low concentrations of BMP, we are going to have neuroectodermal fate. In the presence of high BMP and low nodal, we will have a proepidermal fate. So ectoderm can be either neuroectoderm or non-neuroectoderm. Non-neuroectoderm is synonymous with epidermal or integument. All right, so nervous system and skin are derived from the same germ layer. And if you were to take cells from the animal cap and expose them to these signaling molecules in these relative proportions, high dose of one, low dose of another, you get one fate. Low dose of this one, high dose of that one, you get a different fate. All right. Now, if we look at the cells at the margin or the equatorial cells, the prospective mesoderm cells, uh, same cast of characters with the addition of wingless, all right? Um, so that says INT equals wingless in family. It should say WNT, WINT, uh, for those of you that forgot what that means. So in the presence of low concentrations of BMP, WINT and XNR, you get anterior or um, <clears throat> uh, rostral mesoderm, head mesoderm, uh, low concentrations of BMP, low concentrations of wingless, but a high dose of uh, nodal gives you notochord, low BMP, high FGF, high XNR gives you uh, muscle, all right, promyogenic. And then if we look at the uh, uh, vegetal cells that are going to be uh, coming endoderm, it's really nodal that does the lion's share of the work there. So remember, VEGT is activating nodal. Nodal is promoting the endodermal fate. It's also inhibiting uh, mesodermal fate. Okay? So... We still haven't answered the question, what forms mesoderm? All right, we know that we get mesoderm when we let prospective ectoderm interact with prospective endoderm. But what's the source material? Is, is it ectoderm or is it endoderm? In other words, what actually becomes the mesoderm? And the answer is that <clears throat> some of the cells in the animal cap are induced to become mesoderm by the presumptive endoderm, all right? So essentially, we start out with a situation that is depicted in the middle of these panels here where we've got blue and yellow basically alone. The yolky vegetal part is presumptive endoderm. When I say presumptive endoderm or prospective endoderm, it's the same thing. It's going to become endoderm prospective. We assume it is endoderm presumptive. All right, same idea. So <clears throat> we start out with a system where we've got uh, presumptive ectoderm in the animal cap, presumptive uh, endoderm in the vegetal region, and then through signaling, we get mesoderm. Now, there's another really interesting thing that's pointed out on the illustration on this slide, and I've got a little call out to it. Different regions of the vegetal zone will produce different types of mesodermal structure when they interact with animal cap. So if you take animal cap cells and let them interact with the dorsal most uh, 
endoderm or presumptive endoderm, you are going to get one kind of mesoderm. If you take ventral prospective endoderm and let it interact with uh, animal cap cells, you're going to get different. So you could have blood forming and circulatory stuff, or you could have muscle. They're both mesoderm. They're different kinds of mesoderm. So there's further differentiation of the signaling based upon the regions. All right. Now we're going to get into probably what's going to be the meat and potatoes of this slide deck. And that is the community effect. So <clears throat> one of the things that was done by Newcoop and others in the was to do these explant experiments. And one of the things that they did was they took various amounts of animal cap cells and sandwiched them between presumptive endoderm to see what would happen. Um, <clears throat> so that's what's uh, depicted here on the left. We're dissecting out a late blastula, removing the animal cap, and then we've got these fragments of vegetal cells. We kind of discard the equatorial or medial stuff that is presumptive mesoderm. And we just want to see what's going to happen when we allow the animal cap to interact with the vegetal cells, just like we did in that first experiment several slides ago. Now, this is really, really interesting. It's going to take a while for me to explain this. If you take cells, so in the next panel over on the right, you take a few of those animal cap cells and you sandwich them in between some presumptive endoderm and then you wait and what you will see is that you end up with exactly what you started with some animal cap cells surrounded by presumptive endoderm if however you take a larger number of those animal cap cells and envelop them in presumptive endoderm what you will get are muscle cells, all right? And we now know that epi or <clears throat> embryonic FGF is the potentiator of this effect in this case. And this is called the community effect. And it's called the community effect because it's talking about collective behavior. So how cells behave based upon the number of cells that you're talking about. All right, now this is a different idea than induction. It's related to induction, but it's slightly different. So what do I mean by that? Well, you can say, and we do say, that endoderm induces ectoderm to become mesoderm. So if you look at the panel on the right, we've got ectoderm sandwiched in between endoderm in both cases. In one case, we get squat. In the other case, we get mesoderm. What's the difference? The only difference in this situation is the number of cells. So there's something intrinsic to the number of cells in a developmental process that can have a profound effect upon it. And we call this the community effect. Now, I mentioned to you that it's a little different than induction. So bear with me. Don't let the Charlie Brown teacher voice come down and start blotting this out because this looks complicated. It's actually not very complicated. This is a, a series of circuit diagrams that are showing gene activation through receptor ligand interactions. So ligand, the signal, receptor receives the ligand. There's some downstream cytoplasmic cascade that ends up translocating a signaling molecule into the nucleus and we modulate transcription in some fashion all right now the top of this panel is illustrating the community effect and the bottom of this panel is illustrating induction and i'm going to start with induction panel b because it's a little easier to understand all right if you want to go back and look at this diagram in more detail and parse it out for yourselves, which I encourage, I will make reference to this and come back and explain it a little bit, but I certainly encourage you to, to do this yourself. I have included on the next slide the uh, figure caption from the paper that I took this diagram from. It was a paper by Bluri and Davidson. Davidson is a, or was, just passed away recently, 
a very famous uh, sea urchin developmental biologist who devoted most of his life to working out genetic regulatory networks involved in development of sea urchins and essentially built this sub-discipline of genetic regulatory networks from scratch. So uh, it was a terrible loss when he passed uh, a couple of years ago. At any rate, you can uh, look up the paper or look at that diagram with this caption. In the meantime, I'd like to take you through a cheesy animation that I did to illustrate induction, and then we'll look at how induction is different than the community effect. All right, so here's my rendition of induction. You've got two cells, cell A and cell B. <clears throat> cell A is going to induce something to happen in cell B. So what happens? What do we want to do? We want to send a signal from cell A to cell B. So let's do that. <clears throat> Here's our signal and it's going to go over and bind to the receptor. So the ligand from cell A binds to the receptor on cell B. And what happens? Well, you all know the story. We get a transcription event and the result of that transcription event and when I say transcription event, that's shorthand for things change in the nucleus. What we're doing here is changing the regulatory status of the genome. We are changing which genes are being transcribed. We are ultimately going to be altering the transcriptome, which will then alter the proteome, etc., etc., etc. So obviously what happens is the fate and the identity of cell B has now changed because it has received a signal from cell A. So cell A has induced cell B to adopt a different fate. Okay, cell A could be in this case, well actually let me avoid giving a particular example here because <clears throat> I just want to get through this and then we'll talk about specifics. So cell A has induced a change in cell B, and that change in cell B is essentially a transcriptional state. All right, cell B is in a different state after communicating with cell A, and that's what we call induction. And if you look at the uh, circuit diagram here, that's essentially what's being shown. <clears throat> cell A in our uh, cartoon would be on the left, and cell B would be on the right. I did that on purpose, so it kind of corresponds to this diagram. So <clears throat> what you're seeing here is that little uh, line with the arrow coming up and off of it that's labeled ligand. That's the gene that is being transcribed in cell A that's going to produce the signaling molecule. There's an arrow coming down on top of that ligand that's representing an activation. So something is activating that gene. That gene gets transcribed. The signal gets sent. Now if we move over to cell B on the right, the R is the receptor. So the signal binds to the receptor. We then go down some signaling cascade and some regulatory genes are turned on. Okay, and we have changed the state of that cell. All right, and that's, that's what induction is. When we talk about induction, that's what I want you to think about. All right, now let's contrast that with what's happening on top. All right, what's happening on top is a little different, and that's the community effect. So let me take you through that. My cheese was powerpointy animation of this. So we start out with two cells, cell A and cell B. Now one thing that you should notice right away is that there are two differences between this initial state and the initial state that I showed you before. The first difference is that I've colored the cells the same to signify that they are in the same state. Okay. Uh, whereas when we were talking about induction, one of those cells was in a different state than the other one was. All right. The second thing you should notice is that both of these cells are expressing the same receptor. All right. Now, what happens here is we <clears throat> initiate the production of 
a ligand, and both cells are doing this, and they're producing the same ligand, just like they are expressing the same receptor. All right, I've labeled it ligand L and then ligand prime or L prime. Those guys will bind to that receptor. What do you think happens? Well, you know what happens. We get transcriptional events. But the deal here is that we are inducing, I shouldn't use that word, we are producing the same transcriptional event in both cells because they are receiving the same signal and they started out in the same initial state. All right. So they will change their state in some fashion, but it will be done synchronously. It will be done at the same time in the same way. All right, because we're talking about the same signal, the same receptor, the same initial state, the same end state. Now, this is an example of collective behavior because we're talking about groups of cells that are initially in the same state that are producing the same receptors and the same ligands, okay? Um, <clears throat> the part where it gets a little bit confusing is how does it start? Well, some exogenous signal, some inductive signal is received by one or more of the cells in a rather large group of cells. So we're talking about, generally speaking, hundreds to thousands to millions of cells. Some of them <clears throat> receive a signal, an inductive signal, that turns on a regulatory state that ends up producing this receptor and ligand. And <clears throat> what's going to happen here is that then, as we start producing the signal, that signal starts inducing, if you will, the same behavior in all the other cells in that region. This is a geographically restricted thing because it has to do with concentration gradients. Okay, so I've said here that this is a type of autoinduction where the state change is identical in all the cells that are interacting with each other and they're all using the same ligand and receptor to induce the same transcriptional state change. All right, now what's cool about this is that it leads to changes in gene expression across entire populations of cells, and it leads to the same change. All right, so what happens here is this process enables uniform gene expression across collective groups of cells. It uses a feed-forward mechanism to maintain that state. What I mean by that is the, one of the events that happens during this transcriptional event is the production of more signal and more receptor. Okay, so you've got this. It's not a feedback situation where I receive a signal and then I turn something off. It's I receive a signal and then I turn it on. So it's a feed forward. All right, I made the signal. I'm now receiving the signal and the signal is going to make me make more signal. Okay, now <clears throat> I've mentioned a few, I used a few important words here that should be uh, leading you to suspect a couple of things. I talked about threshold and concentration. And we've talked about thresholds and concentrations before when we talked about morphogens. And there's a similar but not identical concept here. What we're talking about is <clears throat> a population of cells that are creating the same signal and the same receptor sets. And therefore, there's a dosage component to this, as well as the autoinductive positive feedback loop. So in other words, you've got a bunch of these cells that are producing this signal. If that signal has a dose-dependent effect, then you may need a certain community size, a certain population size of cells producing that signal in order to get the outcome that you expect. Not only that, but this same kind of mechanism is used to maintain states. So you can induce a state, but then how do you maintain that state? Well, sometimes the maintenance of a state 
requires constant exposure to a signal. So <clears throat> this idea of a critical community size, the number of cells producing a signal, is directly related to the idea that there's a dose dependency here when you're receiving this signal. So if you want everybody to experience the same state change, you may need a certain population of cells to produce a certain critical threshold of that signal. And if we go back and look at the <clears throat> um, community effect illustration from your textbook, that's exactly what you're seeing here, okay? So the reason that we didn't get any mesoderm forming in the left panel is because you didn't have the minimum required population of cells. You didn't have the community required to produce the effect. The community on the right, larger population size, does produce that threshold and you get the expected outcome. Now there's one other thing that I need to mention and that has to do with competence. So it's not enough to make a signal, you also have to be competent to receive a signal. All right, <clears throat> so that brings up some interesting ideas. And this is right out of your textbook and it kind of illustrates this idea. <clears throat> so we're looking here at hours post-fertilization and we're looking at what the animal cap cells from a xenopus can become. All right, and what, what this is showing us here is that for the first seven hours or so, the animal cells are competent to be induced to form mesoderm. All right. If you try to expose them after seven hours, you won't get that. You won't get that desired outcome. It also is showing you that you need a two hour exposure in order to get the result. So time of exposure is also going to be related to ultimate, ultimately to dose. So you need a certain population of cells producing some signal and you need to maintain that signal for a certain duration of time in order for desired outcomes. Now, two things going on there. One is the cells have to be in a permissive state or a competent state to receive whatever signal you're talking about. So it might be that the receptors that <clears throat> will respond to the ligand that says become mesoderm are only present for the first seven hours and after that they go away. So you could then expose to the mesoderm inducing signal as much as you want and you're not going to get any mesoderm. The other thing is <clears throat> you might need a timing there might be a timing, a critical timing issue here in terms of dosage. If you expose them for 60 minutes, you might get a very different outcome than if you expose them for 120 minutes. All right. And in fact, with respect to ectoderm becoming mesoderm on exposure to endodermal signals, you actually do need a two hour exposure <clears throat> within the window of competence in order for the right states to arise in order for the right transcriptional events to occur. Okay, so let's summarize. What we talked about in this podcast is how germ layers develop from the point of view of signaling. So we learned again that the late blastula has prospective sulfates we talked about how the germ layers are induced. Uh, we <clears throat> learned that in amphibians, maternal factors induce ectoderm and endoderm, but not mesoderm. We learned that mesoderm is actually induced by zygotic factors that are produced in the prospective endoderm. All right, so it starts with that veg T going to nodal, etc. And then we talked about the differences between induction, where you've got a cell inducing a different state in another cell, versus the community effect, where you've got cells that are inducing each other to maintain the same state. All right, and we talked a little bit about how the 
population size is going to determine the dosage of a signal and that that dosage can be critically important. And finally, uh, even though it's not listed on here, we talked about competence. Well, actually, it is in the last bullet point. So <clears throat> the timing of a signal and the competence of the cells that are receiving that signal are going to determine what happens. All right, that's it. We'll see you uh, for the next podcasts where we start talking about the organizer. Okay. Okay.